Hi, I'm James Cooper. I go by Jeff. I'm the director of New England's Hidden Histories, which is a project of the Congregational Library that seeks to secure, archive, preserve, digitize, and place online New England's earliest manuscript church records. Our project has been very successful. You can visit New England's Hidden Histories uh, on the Congregational Library's website. But I don't think that our uh, project could even have gotten off the ground without this, without this volume. This is an inventory of the records of the particular congregational churches of Massachusetts gathered 1620 to 1805. Through this inventory of uh, church records, we have some sense of what it is that we are looking for search for Massachusetts church records. Massachusetts has been the focus of our project uh, so far. And we have at least some general sense of where we ought to look, because at least we know where the records were 15 years ago. We're very, very privileged to have with us today the author of this massive document, Dr. Harold F. Worthley. Uh, Dr. Worthley received his Doctor of Theology from Harvard Divinity School and he served here at the Congregational Library as librarian and executive director from 1977 to 2004. Hal, it's great to have you back. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Um, let me ask you first, if you would please just describe the inventory for our viewers. What is it? It's an attempt to put on paper and make use of uh, the what and where's of the records of the Pilgrim Puritan churches uh, here in Massachusetts between the arrival of the Pilgrims in 1620 and the bifurcation of Congregationalism into particular and Unitarian halves in starting, well, the dates are various, but I chose 1805 because that's the creation of the Hollis Professorship in uh, Harvard Ben College, uh, which was quickly identified as the major pulpit of the Unitarian faith in this country. This is a large question, and a number of the questions I'm going to ask you are large, but what was involved in putting this inventory together? For example, the records that you sought out, were they readily accessible to you? Uh, some records were unknown to the general public. Um, these records were kept in various places, both in uh, secular uh, repositories, in town halls, and sometimes in churches. Uh, it's a kind of hunt, hunt and, uh, hide and seek, and uh, my job, as I saw it, was to cover all of the churches of this tradition formed here in Massachusetts by the beginning of the 19th century. Um, it was a utilization of resources, some of them well-known, some of them obscure. It was writing letters furiously, and. Uh, sometimes getting answers and sometimes not getting answers. It was making personal contacts across the face of the state. Eventually, it was a case of going out and visiting each of these churches or communities and uh, inventory classifying their surviving records going back to the beginning of the 17th century. How many churches approximately did you visit? A little over 90, as I recall. Um, it's uh, one of those things I've never stopped to count, frankly. Mm -hmm. And where did you find the church records stored? Under what sorts of conditions did you find them stored? Some of them were stored in the churches in uh, uh, closets and cellars. Um, some of the oldest records of all are found in a cellar in Plymouth. Uh, 
You may well. Yeah. Uh, church style. Keep the password. <laughs> but anyway, uh, some of them were found in places like the American Antiquarian Society. Uh, some of them were found in uh, private homes. Rarely, but once in a while, in private homes. Anywhere and everywhere. How long did this uh, project take you? Well, the intense part of it took uh, almost 10 years, not quite 10 years. 10 years? Yeah. I can't imagine that you would have embarked on such a Herculean project without a great deal of forethought. So what we're all interested to know is why? How did you come to the decision that these records must be inventory. That these records are so important that I'm going to devote years and years of my life creating an inventory. Well, on the answer, I didn't intend to devote years and years. Like Tao say, the project is through. And <clears throat> I had started out with a concern for the laity of the churches. In my own perverse way, I felt that the uh, congregational tradition had begun to uh, be what I would call heavily clericalized. And I was concerned for the laity, uh, lest their voices be lost and their importance be lost along the way. It started about the time that I was preparing for my own ordination. And uh, one illustration. I insisted that uh, laity, in this case the deacons, should take part in the laying on of hands. This was vigorously opposed by the then chairman of the ministerial standing committee. I won and went off to become very famous in this old way. Uh, but uh, I did have this sense of the importance of the deacons a long defunct office of ruling elder. And I wanted to recover those names, those dates, and a little bit of a spirit of what they were like, what they did, how they interacted with the secular community as well as with the churches. And you understood that if these lay voices and, and the, the role of these lay officers, if, if these were going to be preserved, if these were going to be understood, this information was going to be found in the church record. That was my feeling. I mean, the topic had been alluded to, not really covered, alluded to in a number of scholarly works and popular works. But the usual way of doing it was to pick out a particular set of church records that the uh, researcher or author found attractive and build everything on that. My own Instinct said there's an infinite variety among these uh, human beings as they pursue their fortunes. And I just wanted to taste and bring to light the long forgotten stories. Can you give us um, even an, an approximate sense of uh, how many churches still possess their records versus how many churches saw their records perish and presumably were lost forever. Even <coughs> Fox, I, I haven't really kept track <laughs> since 1970. I know of uh, two or three instances where records have been destroyed by fire or otherwise lost track of. Most churches have some semblance of a uh, semblance of their story on paper, and uh, the inventory was meant to point out where one could look for the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when churches lost their records, and many of them did, um, how? in your travels, did you find that churches lost their records? How did it happen? Uh, 
there are a few instances in which, after the period that I was dealing with, um, the records went with the uh, one of the two churches that are, uh, came out of the division between Unitarian and Congregational. So some of those records were with the Unitarian Church and some of them were with the Congregational. Uh, I don't know if I can answer anything much for what you learned that. Okay, that's fine. Did, did you ever um, encounter churches in which you knew their records uh, existed or you were able to determine their records existed, but there was no one at the church who knew where those records were located? That's happened to me a lot. I imagine that happened to you as well. Your, the response would be, well, we think we have records, but no one knows where they are. I didn't run into that too often. I was fortunate in that respect. Uh, I ran into a few cases where there was a certain amount of unease because we were just coming out of a merger situation between the Congregational Churches and the Evangelical Reformed Church. And there were those people in specific churches who felt threatened by any attempt to look at their records. Hmm. That's interesting because it suggests that when you were doing your work in the early 1960s, the churches had a better handle on their records than when I was doing my work in the 1980s because routinely, I was told, we're not going to dispute what's in Dr. Wicca's inventory, but there's no one in the church who knows where those well, that may be one of the case where a bank branch closed and records were found in the vault. Yes. That thing can happen. Also, I found cases where um, I was told, well, Mrs. So and so has those records, keeps them in her attic. And heaven's name, why it was the proper response, which I didn't make, but uh, occasionally we ran into that kind of situation. Now, the meaning of the term church records isn't necessarily self-evident to everyone. Um, how do you define church records, and how did you decide what to inventory? Well, in a broad sense, first, the church uh, itself made that definition. Uh, the records kept by the officers of the church and its uh, societies, uh, the church treasurer, uh, the minister, of course, uh, the society, the adjunct society to the church, its treasurer, its records of minutes of meetings. Um, anything that the church did, or one of its adjunct bodies did, as church, to me were church records. So you would find the church treasurer's records, uh, you would find uh, records kept by the minister, you would find records kept by the church clerk. These are just a few of the things that come to mind. Um, what I didn't attempt to do was to inventory the records of parishes and precincts that were retained by town officials, or at least they knew where they were. Uh, that was another, another thesis for somebody else to write. Thanks, Steve. This is a very, very broad question, and you may answer this any way that you wish, and you touched on this a, a little bit already, but what do you think that we can learn from these church records? Well, in a broad sense, I think we can learn more about the interaction of church and community as it existed in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, in a narrower sense, I think we can understand better the high emphasis that was placed on church office, not just the ministers who get all the credit, but on the deacons and the ruling elders and the church treasurers and people like this who are interacting constantly on behalf, not just of the church, but of the community as they saw it. 
in some instances, I'm thinking specifically of um, the churches in Granville and uh, Sturbridge, we secured their records um, last summer. In some instances, the church ledgers, as you know, are kind of thin. There's not a great deal of commentary in them. But in the cases of Sturbridge and Granville, um, a, a great many of the supporting documents survive, such as lay testimonies of faith, um, loose pages about, uh, about uh, disciplinary cases, uh, uh, ministerial correspondence. And so it's clear that even in instances where we might think, based on the ledgers, that the ministers weren't keeping careful records, they still did. The, the, the question I'm driving at is this. Why do you think that churches and ministers kept such careful church records? It was their attempt, I think, on the uh, present level to document beyond question what they considered to be the beloved community and its interaction with the world. In a narrower sense, it was a kind of feeling that none of this should be held lost, that it was important. They didn't always know, or they thought they knew why, but they left the future open, saying, here's a guidepost for you. Here's how we did it. Um, this is important. You should know about cases like this. You should know about the baptisms. That's, that's an entrance into the kingdom of God. And these were for them the stuff of everyday life as seen through the eyes of the church, clerical and lay. The worldly inventory was taken on something of a history of its own. When I was in graduate school, I don't think many people knew about it. But now I think that many scholars of early American history of the inventory, and I think that most scholars of early New England history are very familiar with the inventory, and I think it's never been more important than it is now. Does this surprise you? Yes. <laughs> In a word. <laughs> what did you envision for the inventory uh, once you had it completed? I don't know as I looked that far ahead. I was at the time trying to uh, established myself uh, vocationally and uh, I went through several metamorphoses uh, from graduate student and intern uh, to parish minister to uh, librarian here but those were the steps along the way and I won't say I lost sight of it, since I have it on four copies and it sits on my bookshelf there. But it was something I it just I felt I completed what I set out to do. And that's good then to move on to other things. Now, is it true that in the course of pursuing a church's records? You ended up being chased through the church's parking lot at gunpoint. No. <laughs> Sorry to swear with this story. I don't know how that grew up. I did have a memorable evening on, in on the moonlight uh, talking with an elderly lady, we call it that, uh, who was convinced I had come there to take their church's records away from them. Uh, I must have been persuasive because. A, I got to see the records, and B, another scholar who followed me wasn't allowed to. <laughs> Is it true that you became an accomplished safe cracker in the course of your life? Only, only, well, only in one or two cases. Um, 
safes are not that hard. Uh, the safes of the vintage that I was facing were not that hard. The memorable case, of course, is a safe in a church standing up against the wall. And I was told that they didn't know what to do because uh, the card with the uh, combination didn't seem to work all well. Well, I applied my Julie Dummer and Thomas and was able to open the safe. But then, to my surprise, discovered that if they just pulled the safe away from the wall, they had no back. <laughs> they could have accessed it that way. <laughs> this is why memory is fallible, and uh, one or two good funerals, and you've lost uh, church records somewhere. Well, that's one, one of the main reasons why we're working so hard to preserve. Uh, Dr. Wordley, I want to thank you for everything you've done for the Congregational Library, for everything you've done for the scholarly community. And I want to thank you for coming out to visit with us this afternoon. Thank you. It's nice to be here again.